I'm Lisa Bontesumi, and this is the Ath Mindset podcast series on Sports Epreneur. This podcast series is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. Eric Kazimoff of Sports Epreneur is generously hosting the Ath Mindset podcast series on his platform as he deeply believes that these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. This is the Ath Mindset podcast series on Sports Epreneur. Sports Epreneur, the content platform where sports, entrepreneurship, and mental health collide. If you are looking to start a podcast or create original content, you have to talk with the team at Sports Epreneur. I work with them and I vouch for them. It's that simple. Go to sportse.io to learn more. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to have Marcus Ogden on today with us here on the Ath Mindset Podcast. This is something we've been working towards, and I'm just so glad that we're able to share space together. So welcome, Marcus. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. Appreciate it. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm excited. I'm pumped. If people can't see, I got my gear on right now. Marcus is chilling on his end, and we're just going to have fun with this. I mean, Marcus is a former NFL player. He's a keynote speaker. He's a business coach and consultant and three-time best-selling author. But that's everything that he's arrived to be right now. But I'm curious, would you share like, what has been your road to this place? I mean, can you share a little bit about your life growing up and your early relationship with football? We'll go from there. Yeah. So I'm originally from Washington, D.C. We were raised by a single father from the time I was eight years old. My brother was 14. And, you know, my dad was very instrumental in our life. He was just our North Star, our everything. I started playing football as a freshman in high school. I went to St. John's College High School, the same high school that Kevin Plank, who owns Under Armour, went to, and the same head football coach on varsity. And I had a great time. It was a great league. The WCAC is schools like St. John's, DeMatha, Gonzaga, Carol. I mean, it's a very tough academic and competitive athletic league as well. So I had a lot of great experiences. There was a lot of guys from the senior class from every school. Like I went to the NFL, Marvin Brown who went to Alabama, went to the NFL, Zach Hilton who went to North Carolina Chapel Hill, went to the NFL, Josh Ott, same thing, Boston College, the NFL, Brian Westbrook who went to Villanova. You know, he also went to the NFL with the Eagles. So a lot of great competition, a lot of great battles on the field. And that was my first taste of football was playing for St. John's College High School. Wow. Wow. Thank you for all of that background information, too. I mean, we all know, well, you and I know that it's probably about 1% of players get to play in the NFL. Looking back, what do you think was like involved and all of that, that so many from such a small area and small league could go and play at that level? You know, that's a great question, Lisa. It really comes down to your discipline. Like, look at Tom Brady, who's 44, almost 45 years old. Was he the best athlete coming out of college? Absolutely not. But the discipline that Tom showed makes him the GOAT. You know, every player that is great, my brother, Barry Sanders, Tom Brady to... Derek Thomas to Bruce Smith. I mean, I could go down, me and Joe Green, all these greats, right? All had discipline. And they all treated their play in the National Football League with the respect it deserved. And by doing so, they always, I feel, got the best out of their careers. So again, the discipline and the fortitude to stay on track and not give up is really going to be the focal point, I feel, of great players and people playing professional sports. Great. I love the answer. And here's an interesting wondering that we can kind of unpack together. Is discipline something you're born with or is it something that you develop over time and train to develop? What is your take on that? Great question. I believe you have to train and develop it. I think you're born with natural talent. Like my brother was 6'9 in the eighth grade. Doesn't matter how much you are disciplined and work hard. You can't do that. You can't work that hard to do that. But discipline 
and showing up. It's kind of like there's a quote I live by. You don't have to be the best to do your best. And a lot of people I feel are so like, for example, Lisa, uh, I'll be posting this on social media sometime soon. I'll make sure to tag you. So Bo Porter, who used to be the general manager of the Houston Astros, African-American, playing in MLB, great guy. You know who Bo Porter is? No, tell me. So Bo Porter played in, in Major League Baseball. He played for Atlanta, uh, a couple other teams. He was actually the manager of the Houston Astros for two years. Bo now works for Major League Baseball doing like their broadcasting. Great guy. He started a magazine called Core, Champions of Real Excellence. And in 2021, they had their top 100 most influential Blacks today. People like Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, the actor Michael Jordan, Will Smith, Kamala Harris. I go down the list. So then in 2022, they came up with another list of top 100 most influential Blacks. Samuel Jackson, Janet Jackson, Tina Turner. We are on that list. And today, a new article came out in USA Today where they selected four of the top 100 to highlight in the USA Today article with a picture and a bio on them Of course, with the other 100, but they're focusing on highlighting those four. We were one of those four. Marcus, oh my God, wait, like, hold up. Just stop for a second. Okay, we need to acknowledge that and (laughs) have a pause there to really take that in. That's remarkable. Congratulations. And thank you for sharing that with us. And like, just that's immense. So thank you. Well, thank you because this is actually my first podcast where I've talked about this because it just became public today. But why I bring that up is because the discipline that we, again, I say we like me, my team, I do the work, but I have an amazing team that helps me with like being my publicist, website design, content, trademark and patent, videographer, bookkeeper, accountant, lawyer, I have a phenomenal team. But what I'm getting at is the discipline that we've shown to get to where we are today. That's what I feel is the most important aspect of having any type of success. Because for two and a half years, Lisa, I didn't get one paid job, not one. Every job I got was either free or I was told no, absolutely. So what I try to tell people is, is that discipline is what got us to this point, because a lot of people, right, Lisa, would have given up. That's right. Out getting a paid job or two and a half years said, no, I'm not cut out for this. No, thank you. I'm going to pass or go something else. Now, again, we worked other jobs. I ran a football camp, 707. I was a birthday clown at birthday party. I did training in the backyard. I was a full-time custodian for a short time, for about six months, right? All these things that we did But we never gave up and we never got off course. And somebody said something to this to me earlier. My publicist and one of my clients said this at Marcus, people like Samuel Jackson, Tina Turner, Janet, Ken Griffey, they're all amazing. But uh, most of them have done their work. I mean, Janet was like, you know, the icon of the 90s. Samuel, I mean, he still does great work, but I mean, he's not what he was 10 years ago. I mean, people still love him. But they said, you are the next up and coming versus what they have done. I never thought about it like that. Because I'm just in awe. First of all, we were only on the list with these people. Then to be highlighted out of the top 100 to the four, I'm just even more blown away. But my point is, is that that's discipline. Because we could have easily packed it in several years ago, but we decided not to. And that's where we are today. Marcus, that is such an important message and lesson. I can't say enough how inspired I am by that. That's why when I introduced you with all your accolades and successes, that people need to know that you didn't wake up and just be that and have that. There are steps we have to take, sacrifices we have to make, compromises we have to make to get there. I mean, being a clown at birthday parties, working as a custodian, you know, I respect everyone who has to hustle and make a living, but like, That's what you did and you never gave up on the ultimate goal. And so when we talk about discipline, we could tell our athletes, our coaches, be disciplined. Okay, but break that down for us, Marcus. What did that mean and what does that take 
to be disciplined? The biggest thing I believe discipline has or discipline builds its foundation off of is proper time management. Everything I do is in my schedule. Going to the gym, working out, getting a haircut, picking up my daughter, Uh all my coaching calls, all of my sales calls, all of my podcasts, everything is in my schedule. And I write things down and I can even see like what me and my publicists are working on. We have a note section on our phone. My website person, we have Trillo for our entire team to look at things, updates, et cetera. And so I'm a big believer in writing things down. But for me, discipline comes from execution of time management and running your schedule, not letting your schedule run you. Yes, Marcus. That's so important. And I take it to the next level because someone like you and the life that you live, there's always something going on and something you need to manage and shift around. I would even add time prioritization, Mm -hmm. right? To take it to that next level. It's just a language thing, but like prioritizing what you need to do that day, write out your map of the day, week, month, and follow it without pause and without questioning, right? Correct. I think that's super important. So thank you for that. Oh, I agree. I mean, prioritizing what must be done is huge. And then, so like for me, either Friday nights or depending on Saturday morning, I end up doing stuff where I write out my goals. I mean, I write out all my stuff for my clients, all things that are going to be going on, all that kind of stuff. And then from there, I know what has to be done. And I look at things, okay, what has, what's on my schedule? What's priority? What comes first? What happens here? Like I know certain things, like I know Monday at three o'clock, priorities to picking up my daughter from school. Like that's a priority. It always gets done. So time priority and then executing your time management is huge in that regard. Absolutely. So you and I both know research shows that writing it down, there's a different level of commitment that goes in our brain when we're able to write it down first and then transfer it to any electronic sort of way of managing it for multiple people. So I think that's really important. I mean, I work with a lot of college athletes, pro athletes, and it's like, okay, well, I wrote it down, but what if something comes up? What if I feel like I don't want to do it? How do you manage that, Marcus, when you have your best life plan, it's prioritized, it's all listed there, but something comes up or you feel something about something? How do you manage that? So I always go back to one of the big, I call it my five-prong approach to solving problems. And one of the biggest things of the five-prong approach is remember your why under any and all circumstances. And when your why is greater than any excuse you can try to formulate or make up, you're going to always get done what needs to get done. Always. I mean, that's just the way it is. And so it's very important that you or anybody else who is trying to move forward in life, make sure their why is known clearly And that way, your why will push you past any excuse that you try to formulate or make up about why you can't do something. Hallelujah, amen, period. Can you share with all of us, what is your why, Marcus? So my why is my family and my wife and I met on Match.com in 2012. And we ended up dating for a short while. And then she moved in with me moved up to Baltimore, and then I ended up losing my business and everything I owned in 2013 from a bad business deal and a really huge ego. And I remember telling her, well, she wanted to go. There's the door. No issues. I get it. No problem. If you want to leave, I got it. No problem. She didn't. She stayed. And I remember when I got fired from two jobs in the same week, it was late spring, early summer, of 2013, she said, you have one day to mope. And then once you're done moping, get up off the couch and you go out and you become successful like you did with Caden, like you've done in your entire life. And that got me really inspired to go out and do more. And I pushed through a lot of those no's and things like that as a result of the why in which I remembered 
my wife, well, she's now my wife, she's my fiance at the time, stayed with me in a lot of bad times and a lot of hard times. And again, is our marriage perfect? No. But is our marriage very good and strong? Sure. I mean, of course, we still have tips or rips like anybody else. But like I tell everybody, for me, I know that if something ever happened, which again, my ego would never get in the way. So I'm not going to be looking for that to happen because I'm a lot smarter today. But my wife was with me when I lost everything. Mm. So now the home we have, we bought together, our cars. I mean, when we first moved to Raleigh after my home was foreclosed on, both cars were repossessed right off of our rental lot. We were renting a, a small little home here in the Apex Cary area that both cars were pulled off the lot in the same day. Same day, not same month, not same week, same day. Right, right. We had to adjust. And again, my wife stayed with me and beside me the entire time. So I know if things ever got bad, which again, no one ever plans on it, but things sometimes happen, but you just have to be smart, that my wife stayed with me when I had nothing. So that makes me understand that she's with me for the long. No, that's inspiring. I mean, I'd love to meet her one day. She sounds like an amazing woman. You know, we all need at least one of those in our corner. I mean, I have a question here I want to ask you and you went right into it. Like, who are some of like your mentors, your support system? Because we know that to have excellence in our lives and strong mental health, our social well-being is super important. So it's important for us to pour into relationships and then receive that pouring back. So your wife, I know, is at the top of that list. Sure. Who else has helped you along the way or that you've looked up to and believed in you? So there's a guy named Andre Collins who played football at Penn State, played in the NFL for the Washington Redskins and Chicago Bears. He works with the NFL Players Trust and the NFL PA Retired Players Association. And he was the one that told me about going to a program at Penn State back in 2018 to learn how to do what I needed to do to get my life going in the right direction. So that is a major factor there. And then also my coach and mentor is a guy named Brad Mitchell. Brad actually was the creator of the NAPSA program at Penn State. And that's where I learned how to utilize my football skill sets along with my football knowledge, my prior business knowledge that I had with Caden, the ups, the downs, the success, the failures. And I learned how to turn that into dialogue and communication skill sets that are much more well-received by corporate America and by business owners and by people that I was trying to target as clients. And once I learned that in 2018, business got a lot better. We've had a lot more success. We've had a lot more trajectory going up. But again, Brad was the individual that got me to start seeing how to utilize my past athletic skill sets and knowledge, plus my first business success and failure knowledge to actually create the business that we have today. That's amazing. And it shows that we all need a team behind us. Like you said, someone to help coach us, develop us. It's already in us, but to just shape it and let it be palpable to the parties that we want to talk to. I mean, I think there are so many transferable skills that you have playing at that level, the NFL, what besides discipline, besides communication, what are some other skills that you learned as a player, as a teammate, that then you are now using in business? Teamwork, delegation of tasks to the right people, the right team members, how to let go and trust others because the human mind can do a lot of things, but it can't do everything. And if you feel that you have to be involved and micromanage your team, then why are they your team to begin with? So it's really big in that regard because it opens up a lot of opportunity for process and for change. 
but it has to start with, again, making sure that you're able to do all those things. And communication, and like I said, teamwork, delegation of tasks to the right team members, all those things are absolutely vital to help you and have helped me that I learned from football and from sports as well. Perfect. I love that. Thank you so much. I mean, in your story, you've had ups and downs. Your mental health was more solid in some places and more challenged in others, just like anyone's would be in everything that you've been through. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about the space that mental health is occupying right now in sports and athletes coming forward and sharing more about their mental health and their experiences? I would love your take and your just thoughts on all of that. It's interesting you say that. Actually, I was looking at something I was when you said mental health. I made a post yesterday that was created by my team about Mental Health Awareness Month, which yes. was which is May. Yes. It's important because I remember being a guy who didn't want to open up about his feelings, a guy that didn't want to be seen as soft, didn't want to be seen as weak. And what I learned is, is that there's true strength in actually opening up and telling others about your struggles, about your mishaps, about your mistakes. And once I got into that type of mind frame, then things got a lot better. And I really wanted to help others by just being able to share, go and go in that regard. So I think it's very important for you, me, and anybody to understand that mental health awareness and mental health clarity is big. Because I have a coach, her name is Misty Buck. And Misty is really big helping me to process things, not get over anxious or get myself all worked up or trying to find ways to deal with stressful situations better and without being emotional and being more cognitive. And so there are a lot of things in that regard that have really helped me. But I'm a really big advocate of people talking about mental health awareness and really saying that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be like, I've had a problem. So people know I've had anxiety issues. I've had depression issues. I've had addiction. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say I haven't because I have. And being able just to be open and honest, I feel, helps a lot of people. I agree. I agree. And shout out to Misty Buck. I know Misty. So I'm so glad that you guys are connected and she's supporting you. That's awesome. She's a great human being. And thank you for being so open and vulnerable about your story and your commitment to advocacy for mental health. This is an important month. And I think breaking it down, you know, our mental health is basically our emotional, psychological, and social well being. It's how we think, feel, and behave, how we make choices on the daily to manage our lives. That's right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because every day is a choice, right? That's right. You have a choice to have a positive mindset, a negative mindset. You have a choice to be stressed out. You have a choice to be more relaxed. You have a choice to be cognitive and thinking things through, or you have a choice to be emotional and thinking about this or thinking about that. You have a choice. So in reality, I think it's very important that you understand mental health is all about us making a choice to live a better life. Now, again, if you have an issue like I've had, I've had depression and anxiety, I've gotten on Lexapro. I've had to overcome other addictions. I've had to get therapy and get myself help from counselors and all that kind of stuff. There's no shame in that because from what I know, people might disagree and that's fine. You only get one life. That's all (laughs) I know. So if you believe something else, that's totally on you. But I only get one life from what I believe and I'm going to do the best I can with this life. So I'm trying not to argue Even with my wife, I remember I used to argue about certain things about money or this or that. And so then I realized like, you know what? It's not worth fighting about because what? The money's gone. So what's fighting about it going to do? You you can't bring it back. So it's little things like that. And I'm a lot more transparent with that because it caused a lot of problems with me and my wife. And a lot of times looking back on it, it was me like trying to control this and trying to control that. And 
Now, by who I am today, I can look at the bank account and wherever it's in there, I'm not like, oh my God, it's less than I thought by $100 or whatever the case may be. It's like, you know, it's life. And what I find is my wife and I's relationship is better now because when I can look at something and not freak out or get all upset, and then she just, and she realizes that I'm not trying to be the person I was before, because this is what happens. I feel people change, right? So I, when I met my wife, when we first met, she used to do because she was working and then she moved in with me and then we moved back down here. Then when we had Farah, she wasn't working for five years. So she did more cooking, more cleaning. She did more like things for Father's Day to kind of, because she wasn't tired like that because she was not working. She was taking care of Farah, which is a job, but it wasn't like going like she's doing today as a teacher and dealing with all these students and dealing with all these other things, right? So I can't expect her to be the same wife that I had, what, five or six years ago? That's right. Wasn't working. Today Mm -hmm. she is now and she's working and she's got a full-time job. And then our oldest is about to go off to college at NC State. And so she's going to be moving out soon. And so my wife is a little stressed about that. So I try to look at things and say, okay, there's a season. So if I'm going to end up getting upset or getting all belligerent or or arguing with her in a season, it's not going to do well. I mean, my my wife told me this, that marriage and trust in a relationship is like a bank, right? So when you pour into somebody, you're making deposits. When you argue with somebody, when you break trust, when you cheat, when you do infidelity, all this other stuff that you know is not good, it's a withdrawal from your account. Mm. Somebody gets to a point where there's no money left because you put money in, but you keep screwing up with arguing or yelling or having issues and you keep withdrawing from that account. Once that account gets to zero or negative, that person could be gone or it could even happen closer than zero. It could get down to a certain point and like, you know what? I don't want this anymore for my life. I'm going to move on. So what I've tried to learn is, is that in marriage, like in life, there's a lot of things that you, I, or anybody doesn't have to like fight about or any of that type of stuff. I agree. I agree. I'm laughing here listening to you because in my marriage, it's the same way, like in marriage and in life, you know, we both have two kids. We've both been married for quite a while. There's a fluidity to how we show up because as we grow and learn about ourselves, we're able to show up differently. And it's that self-awareness and that emotion regulation that you're talking about. Like, is this really a thing I want to pick about right now? Like, I want to pour in. I don't want to withdraw. So I really love that analogy. It's a really good one for a lot of people to hear. It's easy. Like, are you going to withdraw or are you going to deposit right now? Like, what's your commitment? This is such an important conversation on so many levels because as a Black man, I know in the Black culture, there's a lot of stigma around talking about your feelings, about being that strong person. I mean, it goes back in history. I think brown and Black communities have a lot to be with and understand to be able to come to that place where they don't see that emotions are weakness and that it is actually a strength. Like, what advice would you give to a brown or Black athlete coming up who maybe is considering going to therapy or getting a coach? Like, how would you push through that type of thing? I would tell them that if you want to live your best life and if you want to have the ability to be able to be mentally and physically strong, if you're having a problem, go get help. Because when we're trying to solve our own problems, we really don't see the whole gamut as well, I feel. I feel we don't do a good job of actually figuring out what's wrong, what are the issues. A lot of times we tend to go surface level. And if you're trying to really fix, I feel, again, depression, anxiety, a mental health issue, it's going to be really at the deep root of the problem. It's not going to be where the branches are or the leaves are. It's going to be where that root is in the ground. So a lot of times we by ourselves are not equipped to handle a situation like that. So I want people to understand if you're having issues, if you're having trouble, then go and get help. There's nothing wrong with getting help. It's a sign of true strength going to get help. It's not a sign of weakness. I appreciate that. I really, really do. And, you know, 
coming to that place too, to piggyback on that, maybe going as you anticipate a stressor or a change in life, a transition in some way, like your family's going through the transition of your eldest is going to leave home. And that's going to have an impact on people. Like being able to go in there and get like preventative help, just like we do for our physical health. Like we want to prevent injury on a physical level. Like why not prevent a mental injury and then learn how to handle it? So I really appreciate it. We've been talking a lot about business, your experience in the NFL, your family. In this moment, as you reflect, what is your most proudest moment right now in your life to date? Oh, my proudest moment, personally or professionally? Let's do both. Personally, I've been married now for, it'll be seven, actually our seven-year anniversary is this month, May 23rd. Congratulations. So that's huge for me. Yes. But then I would say business-wise, it was getting our first keynote speech in 2016 because it made me realize that, yes, I faced a lot of negativity. I was told no a lot. I was told you won't succeed at this a lot. And I heard a lot of that negative stigma. But where we're at today, all the things that we've accomplished would not be possible if we didn't stick through it and get our first paid speaking job, which was for Miller Mott College in Wilmington, North Carolina at their 100th commencement graduation speech. And that was the first opportunity that we were able to take and start to move forward and make this a career. And again, we faced a lot of trials, tribulations along the way. We went full-time in this business in 2020, but we needed some sort of a catalyst, some sort of a spark. And the job for Miller Mott College gave us that. That's amazing. I appreciate both of those. It's interesting. So we were married May 22nd. Oh, no. But in 2004, so it was a little bit different. But like, <laughs> we were married within a couple of days of each other, but kind of difference in years. That's hilarious. No, that's awesome. We're connected in that way. I appreciate all of that. I want to ask you one more question before we say goodbye. When the day comes, mm -hmm. when your life here on earth ends mm -hmm. and there's a celebration of life for you, which there will be, your children will be there, your wife, people who you really love and respect and admire are going to be there. What would you want them to say about you? I would want them to say that Marcus was a servant leader that served a cause greater than himself. I asked my publicist today, was she surprised that out of all these phenomenal people in the top 100, against Samuel L. to Janet to, to Tina Turner, Debbie Allen, all these phenomenal people, right? They picked us to be part of that, number one. Number two, they picked four of us to highlight in the biggest paper I feel in our country. USA Today is probably the number one paper in our country, it was read all across the US. And they picked us out of the top 100. They picked four of us, and we were one of the four. And I remember asking my publicist, what did she think about that? And is she surprised? And she said, no, Marcus, I'm not surprised because you're a servant leader that's impacting so many. You work hard, you care hard, and you're doing what's necessary. And then to me, I just think about myself as being Bonnie's husband, Ava and Farrah's dad, you know, doggy dads to our two dogs, Athena and Duke. You know, I don't think about that. But then when she told me that, I was like, wow, that makes sense. But I haven't thought about myself in that way. So my point is, is that what you're saying, what I want to be remembered for is the servant leadership mentality. I think of people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, those were servant leaders, people that served a cause greater than themselves. And what I hope is that when I'm gone, people say the same thing about me, is that I serve a cause that was greater than myself. Yes, sir, I'm sure they will. If you keep going the way you're going, keep giving and inspiring and showing up the way you are, there's no doubt. And people are going to say that before the celebration of life. I'm saying it now. I mean, all the recognition that you're getting, it's humbling and inspiring 
to be in your space. I really appreciate and value this time together. Is there anything else you want to make sure you say or talk about today with me here? I would love to give you the mic on that. I'll leave one of my favorite quotes by Aristotle. In times of extreme darkness, focus on the light. And I believe Aristotle meant is that there's darkness all around us, negativity, hate, people wanting to loathe you or make you feel a certain way. But if you have the internal flame that never burns out, that never gives up on yourself or things that you believe in, then you can always be great. So I love that quote by Aristotle. In times of extreme darkness, focus on the light. And I believe what he really meant was the light is yourself. That's right. The light within. The light within. So thank you so much again. I'm truly honored and privileged to have shared this time. And I look forward to staying in touch, following all your amazing work and just much love. And thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Lisa. I appreciate it. One of my favorite things about our Sports Epreneur content platform is the opportunity to chat with amazing people in and around the world of sports. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to connect more, hit us up on Instagram at Sports Epreneur. Thank you for listening to this Cad Source production, the Sports Epreneur podcast, the podcast where sports and entrepreneurship collide. Sports Epreneur is a content platform, a collaborative team, and a marketing brand that is all about showcasing leaders and difference makers in and around the world of sports. While we create our own content, we also create content with you. This includes collaborative content and exclusive content for your brand. Think podcasts, blogs, social media, and overall content strategy. Our sports content marketing team is specifically niche for those in the sports industry. That includes sports businesses, athletes, managers, coaches, trainers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders in the sports market. The bottom line is we want to help with your sports-related brand, your content marketing, and your story. Connect with us on Instagram at sportsepreneur or find us online at sportsepreneur.com. Sportsepreneur, the content platform where sports and entrepreneurship collide.